Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Today on November 29th, is it November 29th? No, it's November 30th, 2022. Might have to cut that out. We're going to be talking about the oldest profession. You might not be wondering what that is because you probably already know because it's a common saying, but I didn't know what that was. I didn't know why that's what it was anyways. Um, The second oldest profession is spying, but the first oldest profession is sex work. Kind of an interesting dynamic there. We'll get into that. Um, Today, I'm excited to welcome Caitlin Bailey onto the podcast to talk to us about this. She is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Old Pros, and she's also the host of the Oldest Profession podcast. So go check that out. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, before we jump into all of this, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Oof. Uh, I'm so glad that you asked me this question in advance because I've, I've really had a little bit of time to think about it. And, um, you know, full disclosure, I recently lost my father, um, in August, just a, a few months ago. And, and like his, uh, his burial is next week. And so going through that process of, you know, like the cancer diagnosis and hospice and sort of like, you know, sitting with this, this person that raised me and going through, the death rituals has, has shown me something that I wish I knew a decade ago, which is that it's okay to slow down and take care of yourself. You know, I feel like as a young person, especially as a driven person, you know, you, uh, often, you know, in school as an overachiever or in early jobs, like, you know, I remember working like, you know, 120 hours a week for weeks on end. I I missed my best friend's wedding because it was, you know, too close to the election back in like, 2010. And I, I think that I wish there was a stronger voice telling me that like, I was more valuable to my employer, the movement, my friends, myself, when I was taking better care of myself, when I was, you know, prioritizing sleep, when I was moving my body on purpose, you know, when I was listening to that voice that said, like, you know, you're hungry, or you're thirsty. And I feel like, you know, I, I had this antagonistic relationship with my body in my early twenties. And it's because I didn't give myself permission to slow down and take care. So that's what I think I, I would have told myself. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Oh yeah. No, that's yeah. I'm, I'm so sorry. It's a, what a weird note to start a podcast on. Sorry. Uh, professional overshare, but, but, but it really took that, you know, for me as a founder, as an executive director, right. As somebody leading an aggressively, you know, public life, um, I really needed to take a, quite a bit of time, you know, and I did that and the wheels on the bus did not fall off. They got it's better. Here. Yeah. At least for me, this piece of information is such a good reminder. I was just on Thanksgiving break and it was so weird to not do anything. I was like, I have yeah. finals coming up in two weeks. I have to go grind. Yeah, totally. Your anxiety brain tells you a lot of things that aren't true. It took a few days to break through it. And then I was like, but I just like relaxing. You need and I that. I just realized it had been months. And yeah. it was kind of crazy how once I kind of pushed through this like artificial barrier of stress mm-hmm. of not doing anything that like then the signals of like you actually need to take a break came back. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, thank you for sharing, even yeah. though the uh, starting point was not so positive. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and it's, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of wisdom to be gleaned, right. And like hard lessons, right. Um, in, in grief. And uh, somebody gave me a gift at the, at the very beginning of this process, which is like, you know, depressed, uh, think of it as just a time for deep rest, right? And like give yourself, whether it's holidays or like moments of going through a hard thing or like you just can't turn that signal in your body off, like sometimes it's okay to 
lay down, be still, do nothing. You know, the measure of every day is not, did you or did you not produce? Yeah, that's a good, concise way to put it. So there are a lot of questions to be asked, but let's start with some more simple things. What is sex work and how do we know that it's the oldest profession? (laughs) Sure. Well, uh, sex work is a really broad umbrella category that includes, you know, criminalized prostitution, um, also legal, you know, stripping or, uh, you know, uh, being a content creator, whether it's pornography or OnlyFans or being, you know, a foot fetish model or a dominatrix or, you know, somebody who engages in, you know, uh, activities that not everyone would recognize as sexual or erotic, but it is fundamentally the exchange of some kind of erotic labor for money or something of value. So we know that sex work predates money, right, as a concept. And we believe that one of the earliest exchanges was meat, right? Which was, you know, difficult to obtain and absolutely necessary for survival in exchange for sex or some kind of erotic service, right? We see this behavior in monkeys. We see it in penguins. We see it in a wide variety of uh, species, actually. So um, it is older than us, uh, but it is probably not as old as like hunting. Interesting. I didn't know that it entirely encapsulated all that stuff umbrella is a good way to put it is that why the logo of old pros is an umbrella or is that just it is yeah the red umbrella became the international symbol of sex worker rights in 2001 at a a protest um uh at a a conference and art fair um in italy it was um since 2001 cool um so this is i I guess this question becomes kind of irrelevant but i was going to ask what what is the transition of like prostitution sex work like the way that people refer to it sure um one of my mentors actually carol lee um otherwise known as the starlet harlot actually coined sex work uh in the late 1970s at a feminist conference in you know sort of pushing back against the term uh prostituted woman which still makes me want to throw up in my mouth um, and so, you know, Carol Lee coined the phrase sex work, uh, and we've been sort of using it ever since. I feel like it's more, it has less of a connotation attached to it, less intense, even just less. I think it's less limiting, you know, like prostitution is very, is a very specific legal term, right. For a very specific act, but the stigma around sex work you know, sort of touches everyone that engages with this work. It doesn't matter if your work is criminalized or not criminalized. You know, people suffer, you know, social consequences. People lose their kids or their housing or get kicked out of school or lose, uh, you know, their straight job, uh, ironically, when it comes out that they've done this work. So we're going to get into that and kind of the culture surrounding that. But can you give us a brief history of sex work. I mean, given that it has lasted a very long time, I, that's going to be difficult, but like, I keep will, it short. yeah, absolutely. I will, I will do this as quickly as I can, but I will say that this is some, if this is something that interests you, I am workshopping right now. Uh, my second one woman show whores I view, which is 10,000 years of history from a sex worker's perspective in 75 minutes. So I know for a fact that I can go on and on about this for at least 75 minutes, but I think the long and short of it is sex workers um, started as deified, right? We were priests and prostitutes in some of the earliest uh, temples that we have written records about or or even, you know, an oral tradition around. Um, Ishtar from Mesopotamia, Tlaxotl from Mesoamerica. I mean, on wherever you look on every continent, you have, uh, you know, often... Uh, you know, priestess, prostitutes, or, or sexual energy being part of ritual around fertility, right? Um, and then we become demonized, right? You know, it begins, you know, in the, in the Greek Empire and then the Roman Empire, which was like the most patriarchal empire in all of human history. Uh, and then that descends into this medieval period where you see, you know, a lot of diversity in practice. But the Catholic Church does a lot really to, you know, demonize uh, 
women in general and, you know, prostitution and whores and these fertility cults that they were associated with um, together. So there's a demonization process. After the scientific revolution, this demon, demonization shape shifts into a misguided effort to, you know, call us diseased. And there's a lot of criminalization efforts around the idea of controlling for venereal disease. But what we know is that sex workers are actually more proactive and more empowered to advocate for their own sexual health and to use harm reduction tools, including condoms. Uh, it, well, they were early adopters, believe it or not, um, more so than the general population, especially like domestic workers or women who are in vulnerable positions working for men where there was like no protection against uh, sexual harassment and assault at the workplace. So it's interesting, right, that we decide that sex workers are diseased because they were demonized, not because they've ever been, you know, vectors of, of disease. They were characterized. That characteriz characterization during the progressive era in the United States shape shifts into this victim narrative narrative that we still very much have. And so one of the first, uh, you know, federal laws that applied to prostitution here was called the Mann Act, otherwise known as the White Slave Act, right, which made it a crime to transport women across state lines for, quote unquote, immoral purposes. And much like the anti-trafficking laws that have been passed more recently, they didn't do anything, right, to increase the negotiating power of victims, to rescue any sex slaves, but they did prosecute a lot of interracial relationships, interrupted a lot of chorus girls on their way to the next gig, and created an existential threat against the freedom of movement uh, for women, especially poor women. Um, that takes us really to today uh, with the you know criminalization of sex work, this false narrative uh, conflating uh, trafficking and violent exploitation with the oldest profession, which has obviously been many things to many people, um, and justifies a lot of dumb laws and policies that have a detrimental impact, especially on the people they claim to help. So what sort of institutions do we have in place today, government, non-government, that currently influence the culture or is it just residual? No, we have um, a lot of recent laws, actually. I think the, the most uh, impactful um, was the federal and, and on a federal level uh, was SESTA-FOSTA, which was signed into law in April of 2018. It stands for Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act or the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. And as the name suggests, it was sold to the American people as a you know way to fight uh you know, violent sexual exploitation, especially of children. This is when Backpage was, you know, seized by the FBI. This is when Craigslist erotic services uh, sort of disappears um, from the internet. Uh, and a lot of sites that sex workers were using to schedule and screen their clients um, went away, right? All in the name of cracking down on sex trafficking. It's been, you know, we're several years out from that. And we know um that sesta fosta had a devastating impact on consensual adult sex workers. Uh, a lot of this has been well documented, both by universities and also, you know, sex worker organizations who documented the impact that this had on their community and sort of constituents. Um, people were pushed back into homelessness. People were pushed back into abusive relationships. More recently, we've seen a lot of uh, banking regulations, right? Visa and MasterCard refusing to do business with uh, legal erotic performers, um, you know, OnlyFans struggling, like a lot of sex workers, um, even if they engage in legal work, have a hard time accessing, you know, banking, financial and investment services the way that, you know, any regular person would because of discriminatory legislation that conflates trafficking with erotic labor. This is probably a hard thing to measure. So I don't know if you can kind of paint this picture for us, but how many sex workers are there in the world in America? Like, I know <sighs> it's kind of a weird question, but like in your average day, maybe how, how many do you see? Like, are there sex workers all around? Like, it's also like some of them are probably very underground. So you have no idea. But I think that your instincts are absolutely spot on here, that it is difficult to get good numbers about a criminalized and stigmatized class. 
I will tell you that uh, I will also say that I have built a life, right, where I, I travel the country talking about my own experience as a sex worker. I talk about sex worker history and I have found, you know, when you come out, they come out. And so I have never been to an event. I have never been, frankly, to a party where somebody else did not confess to me or reveal to me that they too had some experience, um, either as a client or as a provider. Um, and so, uh, my sense is that this is something that is very common. It's been around for a long time. It's in a lot of places. It takes a lot of forms and it's something that people can kind of dip in and out of to make, to, you know, to make ends meet, right. To solve, uh, you know, short-term financial problems. I believe that sex work has funded more, scholarships, uh, entrepreneurs and artists than all of the grants in all of the world combined. And I would say that as many people have engaged in sex work is at least as many people who have, for example, like had an abortion. Huh. So can you tell us a bit about your story with sex work? Sure. Um, I did sex work at two points in my life. Um, first, as a young person, uh, really from a place of curiosity, right? I come, I come from privilege, right? My parents sent me to college and, you know, gave me a generous allowance. But, you know, I grew up under the George W. Bush administration's abstinence only education policy. And I felt like insulted and actively lied to about my body, right? I remember um, you know, religious leaders, right, coming into my public school to deliver misinformation about my body and just feeling incensed about that. And so prostitution sort of felt like this way for me to test and push against the specifically sexual constraints, right, that were being um, sold to me at that point in my life. So it was very much an act of like premeditated rebellion. It was not coming from a place of need. And because of that, I was able to take a lot of measures that put me in the driver's seat um, in terms of, you know, safety protocols or like not taking appointments that I didn't feel good about or didn't get a good vibe about because I had no urgent, imminent financial needs to meet. Um, the second time in my life, I was subsidizing my, you know, early career as a stand-up comic uh, in New York. Um, I tried working for Starbucks. This was, you know, pre-unionization. Uh, and I was not able to make rent in New York with this series of gigs that I was able to string together as a um, somebody who was aspiring to be to be a performer. Um, and so, yeah, and I did that uh, really until my first salaried position working as the director of communications for decriminalized sex work. Um, yeah, which is a, a national advocacy organization. I, I worked for them for two years speaking to legislators all over the country about this issue and why removing criminal penalties is the only policy uh, that, you know, reduces violence. Um, and then I started Old Pros in 2020 because I feel like we are at a critical tipping point, but that legislation is going to flow downstream of culture, that we will not get good policy on this issue until we are able to do sort of a massive education campaign, both for legislators and also constituents um, about decriminalization and, and change the story of sex work before we can change the, you know, social and legal status of sex workers. And part of what you do is hosting the podcast, The Oldest Professional yes. Podcast. Um, can you tell us some of your favorite figures that you've explored and their story. Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, for for those of you who aren't familiar, the podcast, every episode, we do a deep dive into a different figure from uh, sex work. Next season, we're hoping to do sort of like, you know, important um, important moments in, in sex worker history. But um, I think I am most drawn to, I went, um, I dressed up as Phryne, uh for Halloween this year. She is, she was an Athenian courtesan uh, who was hired by the city state um, to perform sacred rites, including, you know, sort of an impersonation of, of Aphrodite uh, for a ritual. She would dive into the Aegean Sea um, and, and reemerge in a sort of symbolic, uh, you know, re, um, what's it, what's it called when you dress up? Um, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like, I, I'm having a <laughs> blank. I'm like, I'm forgetting a word. Uh, 
happens happens to me all the time i wish i could help you thank you no no no. um reenactment exactly sorry thanks uh, uh, yes so she would you know uh dive you know naked into the aegean sea as a, a reenactment of the birth of aphrodite and athenian citizens would gather and they would say like oh that is is why we pay taxes uh and then you know it, and it was great and she was you know she was a famous courtesan she was sought after as like a status symbol by all of those sort of wealthiest um men men of athens um and she sort of notoriously would change her prices to reflect how she felt about her clients which speaking as a former sex worker is like a real bold move on how to start a session um but she, uh, there was one apparently uh you know notorious king and he said to her, and this was like recorded in, you know, some someone's diary. We have we have records of this, um, where he said, It shames me that you would charge so much. And she responded, uh, if I took a cent less, it would be I who was shamed. And so something about Phryne and the very real cultural power that she was accumulating sort of frightened the the patriarchs of of Athens. And they charged her with blasphemy uh actually for doing too good a job um impersonating uh, aphrodite the goddess and they said that that was blasphemous um which which i think is just crazy right because i've I've worked it this is something like only sex workers have to worry about right like saxophone players and comedians do not have to worry about doing like too good a job at the that they've been hired to do um Mm -hmm. But, you know, she she ends up hiring one of the famous orators uh, of ancient Greece, and he famously strips her naked in front of this jury and basically says, how can you look at this body and not see that it is divine, right? Like, if if you uh, execute this woman, right, it was a, a capital offense, you will anger and upset the goddess. And so... They, she was acquitted um, and Phryne got to live, but it's sort of a moment of cultural shift, right? That like, it's sort of the last, the last gasp, right? Of a culture that has enough, at least fear, right? Of the goddess, right? To, to acquit uh, Phryne from the horrible crime of doing too good a job uh, being naked. Wow. Yeah. And you were that for Halloween. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, so I, you know, I, you know, so I dressed up as Aphrodite and introduced myself as Phryne and, and confused uh, drunk people and gave them the speech that I just gave. I feel like it's kind of fun. It, I mean, yeah, um, I've been cornering people at parties uh, for over a decade with these kinds of anecdotes. I was, I was stagflation. And so people would be like, what are you? And then I would proceed to explain that I was stagflation. <laughs> This so is like, a little don't invite different. policy people to parties. I think is all of our listeners take away. Uh, we we're yeah, just like maybe this. not <laughs> not the type of fun that they want. It's fun for me though. Yeah. <laughs> so this line of work mm-hmm. obviously comes with a lot of pushback. Um, and if it's okay with you, I kind of want to talk about like more people in more close circles. So like. Obviously, there's all of society, but there's also friends and family mm-hmm. if they know. Yeah. Um, and they don't necessarily. So what is that sort of dynamic from what you've observed from your personal experience, whatever you're comfortable sharing? Sure. I mean, what are you the know, responses that sex workers get? Yeah. I mean, I, I think what we see is that the the stigma around this work and specifically the criminalization around this work it puts people who have engaged in this really like sort of at any level and for any amount of time just in a weaker position across the board, right? This comes up in custody cases. This comes up when people are applying for, uh, you know, for jobs or for housing, right? If they've ever been arrested for this work, if it's possible to Google them, right? There are a lot of states that helpfully post people's mugshots, Um and and otherwise make it impossible. Like even if you expunge your your record, it's uh, a lot of resources um, to overcome an arrest. And it, it's actually something that I find really interesting because you know as a society we claim that we want to be discouraging this work, right? But the fastest way to trap somebody in prostitution or uh, criminalized work in general is to arrest them for prostitution. Uh, so that's. I'm sorry for for going off on that tangent. But yeah, as you were saying, my 
you know, my first experience with domestic violence sort of happened immediately after I told a boyfriend um, several years ago that I had once done prostitution and his sort of visceral response to that um, was, was, it was literally overwhelming. And so I know that uh, there are a lot of people that engage in this work that their, you know, friends, family and partner don't know. Um, and I know that there are people who engage in this work where their, their partner, their friends and their family do know. And in both cases, it can often result in that person being at a disadvantage. And what we know is that vulnerable people are exploitable. Um, so I would argue that prostitution is not in and of itself violent and exploitative, but that the stigma and criminalization around sex work necessitates that people that engage in sex work are more vulnerable to violence and exploitation. Do you think that that would go away, um, if not entirely, almost entirely, if sex work were decriminalized, destigmatized, all of that? We don't. Yeah, we don't we don't have to imagine that future. Um, New Zealand decriminalized sex work in 2003 and has had really persuasively positive results. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes to come out was, a, a you know, after several years after the decriminalization of prostitution in New Zealand, a young woman um, in New Zealand was engaging in adult consensual sex work and her client refused to pay her at the end of her session. So she called the police. Um, the police called the client and said, essentially, uh, do you want to pay this young woman for her services or would you like us to, you know, pick you up? Uh, and I, I think that's an amazing demonstration that like sex workers would love to be able to report violence against us, right? Be able to um, help keep our communities safer and healthier, uh, contributing, you know, our wisdom uh, to the, the communities that we're already a part of, but for threat of arrest or all of these social consequences. And so um, in, you know, in New Zealand, I think there was something like 80% of sex workers reported feeling more comfortable um, reporting violent crimes committed against them. And I think that that's, uh, that's a future where we, you know, we can all strive for. And um, what are the other benefits or what, what factors feed into your case for the decriminalization of sex work? What do you, what's your little spiel on that? Sure. I mean, you know, the decriminalization of sex work is the removal of criminal penalties for people, you know, buying, selling, or facilitating sexual services. So we're working towards a future where nobody is arrested, fired, evicted, or loses custody of their children just for engaging in consensual adult sex work. And what we know is that this is the only model that reduces violence across the board and reduces the transmission of STIs. And you don't have to believe me, you can listen to Amnesty International, the World Health Organization, UN AIDS, and the Freedom Network, which is the largest provider of services to trafficking victims in the United States. These are all human rights uh, oriented organizations who have taken a critical look at this issue and seen that removing criminal penalties makes people, people safer and healthier. It increases the negotiating power of victims and service providers. Uh, and it, again, is the only model that reduces violence. You do not see those results with any form of criminalization or regulation. Nevada, for example, the only state in the union with legal regulated prostitution has the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution related offenses. There is a rich uh, black market for sexual services in Nevada where you see all of the harms of criminalization repeated. Uh, this is because this is a model that only benefits brothel owners. We are not going to arrest or regulate our way out of this issue, but we can make everyone safer and healthier by just removing criminal penalties. I can hear the uh, horrified um, <laughs> thoughts of people as they listen to this. I hope to hear so from them. Please reach out. <laughs> So what would that world look like? Um, are we going to have like strip clubs on every block, sex workers walking down the street? What does that world look like? Does it look like this world? Does it look like a different world? Uh, it looks a lot like this world, right? Like, I mean, 
the decriminalization of sex work uh, in New Zealand did not result in a proliferation, right, of like tacky brothels everywhere. That's the kind of thing that you see in red light districts, right, where you have sort of a constant, where you have regulatory pressure concentrating, right, vice or or uh, something around a, something specific. So um, I believe that in a world where we have decriminalized sex work, we have disempowered uh, the state, right, from policing people's private sexual choices, right? I think the decriminalization of sex work will um, mean that police officers are not allowed to harass, harass people based on what they're wearing. I think that there are some like basic libertarian principles around the freedom of movement and freedom of association and freedom of spa- of speech that make every effort to police prostitution deeply uncomfortable. Um, and we have example after example of people who never engaged in criminalized prostitution, right? Being arrested uh, or deported or harassed, right? Simply for being at the wrong place at the wrong time um, or making the wrong kind of eye contact with a police officer. So I think that there are a lot of positive consequences of decriminalizing sex work that make all of us, whether we've ever engaged in this work or not, safer and freer. What are the most common arguments that you hear against decriminalizing? I hear a couple of things. Uh, Most often I hear, you know, the sort of anxious conflation between trafficking and sex work. And I just want to say that there is nobody more committed to ending violence and exploitation in the sex industry than sex workers themselves, right? We all have a shared goal of making it harder for predators to operate and easier for victims to seek services and get access to the things that they need to keep themselves safe. And what we can say, and what we have a lot of empirical evidence to support, is that we are never going to arrest our way out of this problem. That the answer to trafficking is not more police raids, it's not shutting down more websites, it's not making it harder for adult consensual sex workers to operate. It's to acknowledge that they exist, stop trying to criminalize our work and listen to victims of sex trafficking about the things that they need. So I kind of want to draw attention to the fact that you talk about it as decriminalizing and not legalizing. Why make that distinction and why that distinction? It's 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 kind of the same question. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an absolutely critical distinction to make. So thank you so much for asking. Um, Mm -hmm. Decriminalizing sex work removes... uh, Sorry, excuse me, let's start over. Decriminalizing sex work removes criminal penalties, whereas legalization creates new regulatory structures, whether it's licensing or registration or mandatory STI tests or red light districts. And it creates a a, sort of like government enforced monopoly that essentially only benefits brothel owners, right? We've seen this in Nevada. We've seen this in Amsterdam. We've seen this um, in places where the major effort is on containing and controlling prostitution rather than recognizing that like we already live in a world where there is just sex work about. And in the same way that all of us are able to sleep at night knowing that our neighbors are engaged in all kinds of erotic shenanigans, uh, right? Like, we can just continue to live in a world where sometimes people exchange money for sex. And I mean, even that, I know a lot of free market people that even though they believe that the government shouldn't be involved in that sort of thing, because obviously it makes for a sort of discomfort, they're still not comfortable with the idea that sex is something that could be or should be sold in through a market. Um, What sort of thing, what do you say to those people? I mean, I just think it's interesting that prostitution has become a symbol of exploitation in a world where we have soldiers and people that work in mines and people that destroy their body in like, a very sort of objective and measurable way when 
prostitution is bringing somebody pleasure for money, right? It's like one of the most natural and like healthy things that you can do. There's a lot of um, hand wringing and uh, sort of projection, I think, that that sex work absorbs that has very little to do with the lived reality of what it means to be as a, a sex worker. And I think that it allows us to sort of turn away from the other examples of very real exploitation that happen all around us. So then kind of on the same vein, but a different vein, what about romantic relationships? I know you touched on kind of the not great response of that one partner, but how do you maintain a romantic relationship while engaging in that sort of thing? Is it common for sex workers to have stable, healthy relationships or are they often more single? I think it's important to pull back and recognize that sex workers are all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there are lots and lots and lots of happily married sex workers that are open and honest with their partners. There are also lots of sex workers who maintain a double life. And there are a lot of sex workers who are um, single or in like sort of alternative open relationships, right? Um, And so I don't think that there's anything inherent about sex work that like diminishes somebody's capacity for intimacy in the same way that like, I don't know, trauma would. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that like, again, you know, my my father was a soldier, right? Like I'm, I'm a soldier's daughter. Like I was, I was raised in a household with somebody who was the pointy end of the spear for, you know, three deployments. So I've seen the impact uh, of what it means to like do violence for money. And I think that, you know, we should be asking really big questions about the impact of that. But like, I am happily married. Many of my friends who are still actively engaged in sex work are happily married. I think that we have actually a a language for intimacy and a lot of wisdom uh, to lend to romantic partnerships and intimate relationships and negotiating boundaries. Huh. So can you tell us a little bit about your one woman shows? You mentioned Whore's Eye View. Sure. um, But You had one before that. I did. I did. Uh, My first one woman show uh, was called Cuntatagious uh, because I was very cheeky uh, as a stand up comedian. Um, And it is about coming out to my father as a sex worker. Huh. That must have been quite an experience. I mean, especially if you made a show about it. Yeah, it was. It absolutely was. Yeah, my father and I really got to to a good place. Um, I feel very honored. Uh, to have been able to spend the time that I did with him, especially in the last few years um, of his life. And actually, it was after coming out to him as a sex worker that I was able um, to get him to share with me and and write down um, his story and his memoirs, which I'm honored to have been able to do um, before his death. There was a kind of like honesty that became possible that was sort of not there before, um, you know. I think is interesting. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's been great to have you on. Listeners, go check out Whore's Eye View and the Oldest Profession podcast. Um, I have one last question before we wrap up. What is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? I think at one point I really believed that I could like push myself out of any situation by sheer force of will, right? That like, that I could work sleep deprived, right? That I didn't need to eat, that I could, that if I, if I just kept going, that I could just keep going. And I have been humbled really in the last decade that that's not true. That it's, that it's not only okay to rest, but that it is vitally necessary. And if you ignore those signals long enough, your body will take those options away from you. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight. And I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. 
If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.